Imam Abu Hanifa was endued with intelligence beyond measure. At one time, the Romans, who were at war with the time of Umar, the Muslims had entered Rome and they had reached as far as China and Spain. And thoughts of like philosophy and argumentation began to come into the lands of the Muslims. And so there were disagreements about things. People started to use their opinion, opinionated. So these scholars came in to set straight these people's thoughts once again. Abu Hanifa was one full of reasoning. And the Romans sent an envoy, a man, trying to put doubt about their religion. So a man came along and he said to the people, I have come with three questions. He stood up and he said, my first question is, who was there before God? And then the second question, right now Allah is facing in which direction? And number three, what is Allah doing right now? Abu Hanifa was only about 10 years old or 12 years old that time. No one could answer, so he said, let me answer, Father. So he came up and he said to him, as for who is before God, he said, count from 10 backwards. And he counted until he reached zero. He said, what's before one? He said, zero. Zero is basically the end. And he said, what's before one? He said, nothing. So the Lord of the worlds, the glorious creator, how can he not be the beginner of everything when in actual common sense and logic, you count backwards and you end up with one and there's nothing before that. Then he asked him the second question. He said, what about God? Where is he facing? In which direction is he facing now? He said, if you light up a candle, what do you see? He said, light. He said, in which direction is the candle light facing? He said, uh, it's not facing any particular direction. Light is facing everywhere. He said, then what do you say about Allah who is the light of lights? Nurun ala nur. How can I say in which direction he is facing? As for the third answer, he said to him, to answer your third question, you have to come down here and I go up there because the people want to hear the answer and if you want to earn your fear because you made your question in front of people, let me answer in front of the people. So he thought that's common sense. So we got up and he said, what is Allah doing right now? He said, right now he is making the one who is on falsehood come down off the pulpit and the one full of success to climb up the pulpit to answer and prove you wrong. So he said, this is what Allah is doing right now. Every action that happens in life, this is what Allah is doing. Right now, Allah is doing this. If it wasn't for God, we will all be non-existent, dead, gone. Because we don't keep ourselves alive. Allah keeps us alive. Allah keeps everything in motion. Al Qadi Abu Yusuf describes his teacher and the following. He says, he was extremely pious. He avoided forbidden things. He remained silent and absorbed in his thoughts most of the time. He answered questions only if he knew the answer to them. He was very generous and self-respected. He never asked a favor from anybody in his life. He shunned the company of the worldly-minded people. And he didn't like having a position or status. He avoided gossip and slander. He only spoke well or he, or he was silent. Abu Hanifa, even his enemies who imprisoned him and whipped him, he had nothing to say but only good or he was silent. Generous with his knowledge as well as his wealth. This was Abu Hanifa. Allah bears witness of greatness to himself that there is no God worthy of worship but him. And he bears witness to the greatness of his creation of the angels. And he bears witness to the importance and greatness of those endued with knowledge. The first of them is the great Imam Abu Hanifa. But his real name is Al Nu'man ibn Thabit ibn Al Nu'man ibn Zurjuban. Zurjuban is a Persian name. So Imam Abu Hanifa was of Persian origin. He was a non Arab. But he was born among the Arabs, lived among the Arabs, and learned the Arabic language. But this man, Abu Hanifa, was also nicknamed Imam al Muslimin, the leader of the Muslims. He was also nicknamed Al Imam al A'zam, the ever so great Imam, the great scholar. 
He was nicknamed this even by the scholars who came after him. And even by the contemporary scholars, scholars that lived in his time, they named him Al-Imam Al-A'zam. And this is a nickname of Abu Hanifa as well. Imam Abu Hanifa was what we call one of the generations of a tabi'i. A tabi'i is anyone who met a companion of the Prophet believed in the message of the Prophet and died on that message. And guess what? Imam Abu Hanifa, the majority of scholars and historians say that he was a tabi'i. The reason why they say he was a tabi'i was because he actually lived and met some of the companions of the Prophet and one of them was Anas ibn Malik Abu Hanifa was only about 13 years old when he sat in one of the classes of the companion Anas ibn Malik and at the age of 13 Anas ibn Malik died he was born in the year 699 80 Hijri Abu Hanifa was tall wide very handsome looking, long black hair, from Persian origin, beautiful big eyes. And he was a scholar of two very important subjects, Aqidah, theology, and Fiqah, jurisprudence, how to practice your deen in Salat, prayer, fasting, legal systems, chronology, inheritance, finance. He was a extraordinary scholar of these areas. Every area of interaction of life, every area, he was the man. And by the way, Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi was born in Iraq, in a city called Kufa. In that area, Kufa, and another area called Busra, Busra in Iraq, and Mecca and Medina, they were the center of knowledge. The scholars of the world centered there, the best scholars of the world. And Abu Hanifa was born in Kufa. But first, these scholars that lived around them, the majority of them, the majority of them were non-Arabs. Not only that, many of them were either sons of slaves who had been freed, or they were non-Arabs who migrated. And a lot of them, they converted to Islam, they were not Muslim. And these great scholars, we live our religion today off their backs. As for Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah he was a freeman, he was never a slave. And his grandfather, was a friend of Ali radiallahu In his time, the Umayyad era was a time where Khalifas were coming, leaders of Muslims were coming and going. But there was one problem. These new leaders of Muslims, he lived in the time of about 40 different leaders of the Muslims. One of them was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, a great leader. But the rest of them, they were corrupt. He lived in a time where rule was being corrupt by its leaders. And he was fed up with that. Because Imam Abu Hanifa was a man of justice and fairness. He was born in the time of Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan, one of the Khalifas. And then he died. And then he lived a little bit with Amr ibn Abdul Aziz for about two years. And then came the one he had the most dispute with, the leader of the Muslims. His name was Abu Jafar al-Mansur. Abu Jafar al-Mansur was also a scholar. He was a scholar of hadith and scholar of fiqh. But it goes to show that not just because if a person has knowledge that he, is, he or she is necessarily a man of God. People use their knowledge for corruption. And people can use their knowledge to be God-fearing. My brothers and sisters, knowledge, but they have no good character, they are not the scholars which Allah praises. If you have arrogance and proudiness over what you know to show it off in front of people, you are not a alim. If you learn knowledge only to debate people and to make them look like they were wrong and you were right, you are not a alim. If you have great knowledge and you abuse and disrespect, you are not a alim. The ulama are the ones who fear Allah and we're going to study what Imam Khalifa was like. So this man, Al-Mansur, even though he knew Abu Hanifa was among the greatest scholars, he was also corrupt in his rule gave land to family members and was unjust. When it came to courts doing justice on members of the, of the government, they gave him favors. But when he came from a person from the common people, they ruled against him with harshness. One day, Imam Abu Hanifa, he operated a business in textiles, silk and material. This was his business. 
And that was his trait. Imam Abu Hanifa refused to ever accept any money or wealth or reward for teaching his knowledge. What he did was, from his business, the profit that he made was in order to sustain himself and to sustain his students. He had over a thousand students in one time and he used to pay them. He gave them his knowledge and he gave them wealth to sustain themselves. So he did not have to, you know, obey the government injustice. He didn't want anything from them. He didn't need anything from them. He was self-sustained. And he did not care what he said, so long as it's the truth, even in front of the biggest tyrant. That was Abu Hanifa. A man of truth, spoke the truth, and spoke the truth at the right time, and only spoke the truth when the truth was going to be beneficial. He was passing by one day, he was about 19 or 21 years old, and a great Imam, a Shabi in Kufa, saw him. And Imam al-Shabi has something called Farasa, which means if he looks at someone, he can tell a lot about that person. He looked at this young boy and he mistaken, he mistaken, he thought that he was a student of his. So he asked him, where are you going? And the Imam said, uh, I'm going to, for, on a business uh, errand. He said, that's not what I'm asking you. Why aren't you in class? He thought there was a student. Abu Hanifa said, uh, I'm not really a student of, of knowledge. Shabi looked at him with a sad face and said, No, you look like an intelligent young man and I could see it in your face. How about I advise you to take on knowledge of this deep? I think a lot's going to come out of you. Imam al Hanifa that day, he thought about it. And truly this inspired him to become a student of Imam al Shabi. And so he began his journey of knowledge. Imam Abu Hanifa took some lessons under this Imam al-Shabi, but there was one problem. As I said before, there was philosophy and argumentation, the science of argumentation in the land. So Abu Hanifa used to sit in some of the circles, and the students and people began, they loved to talk about issues and argumentations, you know. And he started to get, get sucked into this philosophy and argumentation. But then he found that this philosophy was not based on real proof. And all it did was, it hardened the hearts. So he said, I didn't like it. He left it and he went to his next uh, shaykh after studying with Imam Shabi, passed away, and he went, went to his renowned shaykh, Hamad ibn Sulaiman. Shaykh Hamad ibn Sulaiman came to be his teacher for the next 18 years of Abu Hanifa's life. Imam Hamad, he studied of companions like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Anas ibn Malik, great companions of the Prophet so brothers and sisters, Abu Hanifa was not just a person who spoke from his mind. He was a man who spoke through evidence and proof. And he learned of shaykhs and masters who learned of companions such as Ali radiallahu anhu, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Malik ibn Anas. These were companions of the Prophet and endued with great knowledge. He wasn't just any man. As people assume, I hear about people saying, Oh, the Hanafis, Abu Hanifa, he hardly used evidence and proof. He deduced information through his opinions. No. On the first day, Imam Hamad placed Abu Hanifa in the back row. From the first day, he noticed Abu Hanifa was very bright. So from the next day onwards, Abu Hanifa always sat on the right side of his Imam Hamad until his death. There was no scholar that Imam Abu Hanifa did not sit with in Kufa or Basra or even Mecca and Medina. He sat with them all. There is even one time when he went to Medina and he sat in one of the circles of Imam Malik. At the time he was 13 years younger than Imam Abu Hanifa. And when he left, Imam Malik met with uh, another contemporary scholar who was sitting there. He said, do you know who this man is? He said, no. He said, he is Abu Hanifa. He is the man that if you were to tell me that this pillar, which is made of brick, is made of water, he can convince me. Because he was so intelligent in his words. So Imam Abu Hanifa learned of Imam Hamad over in Kufa, and then in Basra, and he learned of Imam Hassan al Basr, and he continued his knowledge from these great eminent scholars. When Imam Abu Hanifa was about 30 years old and one day his teacher said, I have a funeral to attend, a family member of mine died, so can you take my place? 
Two months, Imam Muhanifa had to be the teacher to, to the students. He goes, in those two months, 60 <coughs> issues were put to me. And I answered them all. And I wrote them all down to check them with my Imam when he came back. When my Imam came back, I gave him to check my 60 matters. And Imam found 40 of my answers were correct and 20 of them were incorrect. Abu Hanifa said, I said, Wallahi, I will never take a class again until my Imam dies. And truly that's what happened. Showing you brothers and sisters, as soon as someone learns a hadith or two, you want to give fatwas left, right and center, you become an Imam and a Shaykh, and you like people calling you a Shaykh. Imam Abu Hanifa developed something that no other Imam before him bit him to. He developed something called a code of principles in how to directly look at the Qur'an and Hadith and make a ruling out of it. And be able to study that verse and study that Hadith to bring out more than 10, 20 or even 100 different principles and rulings. No one knew how to do that. Now remember, why did he have to do that? Because the Muslims had dispersed throughout the world and they had gone to places like Spain and Greece and, and so on and societies were different there and the Muslims needed more information, more things to be able to settle their affairs in life. For example, today we have cigarettes and smoking. How do we know cigarettes and smoking is haram or halal? In the Quran it doesn't say cigarettes are forbidden, so don't smoke cigarettes. Or ecstasy pills are forbidden, so don't take ecstasy. But Imam Abu Hanifa, he helped us. He said, in order to derive new things that come up in your society, and to know whether the halal and haram, when you can't find a direct information in the Qur'an or the words of the Prophet peace be upon him or his actions then I will teach you how to use the same sources to understand in everything in your life whether it's good or bad permissible or not permissible he was the first to create that system no one before him could do that and the latest scholars that came after him also used Qiyas and the same principles after him in fact, they elaborated on it, they improved it even more. So don't anyone say Imam Abu Hanifa innovated something. No, no, he did not innovate anything, and none of the scholars that came after him ever said so. What he did was, he made the understanding of our religion easier. And that's why the majority of the people of the world follow the school of thought of Imam Abu Hanifa. But Imam Abu Hanifa taught us to use evidence and to always not take something blindly. He also said, my words and the words of others can be rejected at any time. We say something today and tomorrow we may change our mind. All except what goes back to the Quran and to the Prophet peace be upon him. That cannot be rejected. And if what you see and what your scholars discover that is more closer to the truth of the Quran and the Sunnah is better than mine, then throw my saying across the wall and take that as my saying, for this is all my goal, and this is the goal of all the scholars anyway. When his Imam Hamad died, he took over his school. When he took over his school, he had 1,000 students. In one year, every single school in Kufa had closed down, and they all joined in the school of Abu Hanifa. More than 50,000 students at one go. They were with them every single day in hardship and in ease. There is a story. There was a man by the name of Imam Bakir. Imam Bakir was from the family line of the Prophet Muhammad Great great grandson of the Prophet So the Prophet was his great great grandfather. One day he came up to Abu Hanifa and he said to him, So you're the one who contradicts my grandfather by using logical reasoning. Abu Hanifa looked at him and said, how dare I? Let me prove it to you. He goes, how? So then ask him a question. Who is weaker, the man or the woman? He said to him, the woman is weaker, physically. So he said, well then, it only makes sense that in inheritance, she should get more than the son. But I didn't say that. I said what Muhammad said, or what Allah said. 
for the boy double of what the girl gets. Then he asked him another question. He said, which is more important, prayer or fasting? He said, prayer. He said, then by logical reasoning, the woman during her menses, during her menses, she doesn't fast, right? Or pray. Isn't that right? But by logic, she should make up her prayers and not make up her fasting. Or at least both together. But instead, I said the opposite. I said what the Prophet ﷺ said, you make up your fasting, but you don't make up your prayer. And he used one more about Ali radiallahu anhu. That if you wore your khuf and you wanted to make wudu, logic reasoning says that you should wipe underneath, underneath that, that khuf rather than over on the top. But Islam says wipe over the top. So Imam Abu Hanifa, for those who think that he was a man that just uses logical reasoning, you are far away from the truth and you are far away from understanding who he really was. When he said that, <coughs> Imam Bakir, who is the great-great-grandson of the Prophet a tear came from, dropped from his eye and he grabbed Abu Hanifa's forehead and kissed it. And he said, thank you. you know, he loved him after that. Once, as we said, he was a businessman, right? So once he had to go to teach somewhere, and he got one of his uh, pupils, his name was Hafs, and he said to him, can you take this silk to sell it in the market for me? So the man said, of course. He said, but wait, before you take this silk, there are defects in it, there's problems in this silk. And before you sell it to the people, you have to tell them about the defects in this product. He said, sure. So he went out. And Hafs was so happy that he's selling the product, the, 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 you know, the merchandise of Imam Abu Hanifa. He got so excited that he forgot to tell the people about the defects. And he started advertising. Silk, 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 silk. Everybody came and bought it. That day he made so much profit. He made 30,000 dinars. That's a large amount of money. And he came back and gave them to Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa looked at him and goes, oh, you sold all of the material. He said, yes, and I made 30,000 dinars. Abu Hanifa got happy. He said, now I can spend it on the students and on the poor and the needy. So then he remembered, he goes, what happened to the people when they heard about the defects book? And he still made that profit. And he said, oh no, I forgot to tell them. And Imam Abu Hanifa, you know what he said to him? He said, then this money is not lawful for us. We took it unlawfully. We cannot keep it. So what are you going to do? He said, give it in charity. And he gave all his wealth in charity. He didn't take any of it. Nothing. Once, a man owed Abu Hanifa 10,000 dinars. And this man tried to avoid him. So Abu Hanifa went up to him and stopped him. He took him aside and he said, why are you avoiding me? And the man said to him, well, Abu Hanifa, I'm embarrassed. I'm too shy because I owe you the money and I can't pay you. Abu Hanifa looked at him and said, well, you don't need to avoid me. I'd rather you be my friend. If you can't pay them, then don't. And he let him off 10,000 dinars. There was once a neighbor of his, he, he was an alcoholic and he liked singing a lot. And by the way, the Madhab of Abu Hanifa is the most strictest and harshest against musical instruments. And he had a neighbor who used to love singing music, singing and music and an alcoholic. So let's see how Abu Hanifa dealt with it. Every night Abu Hanifa would sit back to write and study and his neighbor would be singing and drinking and he would say the following words. Nobody cares about me. Everybody shuns me. I'm a nobody. I wish I was dead. And Abu Hanifa would listen to this every night and he would sing this poetry. One day, one night, the man didn't sing. So Abu Hanifa asked about him and he found out that the government had taken him to imprison him. So Abu Hanifa went to the um, governor and he was a good friend of his. And the governor said to him, Abu Hanifa, come into my house. You don't have to do that. Ask me and I'll go to your house. That's how much he was respected. He said, what have you come for? And he said, I've come for my neighbor. And he said, what would you like us to do? He said, I'd like you to release him. I want to intercede for him. Buy him out. He said, no, there's no need to buy him. So they brought him. And as he was exiting, Abu Hanifa looked at his neighbor and he said, Have I done good by you, my neighbor? And he said, you have done so well. As for me, wallahi, I will never drink again. And guess what? He became one of the close students of Abu Hanifa and one of the renowned scholars that we read about. <laughs> Sufyan al-Thawri was one of Abu Hanifa's uh, allies. And there was another student whose name was Yazid ibn Kumayt. He says, I once prayed behind Abu Hanifa in prayer. 
And Abu Hanifa recited the following verses. When the earth is shaken to its final quake. And then the verse goes on by saying in the end, And there isn't an atom's worth of good on that day except that it shall be revealed. He says, We finished the salat and everybody left. I looked and I found Imam Abu Hanifa still in the masjid exactly where he was sitting. And he was weeping and weeping tremendously. He said, we left after Isha and I came back at Fajr to pray in the masjid and Abu Hanifa was still sitting in the same position he was. Still weeping and grabbing his beard like this. It was soaked. And I heard him say the following words. Allah rewards the smallest of virtues and punishes for the smallest of sin. O oh Allah, save Nu'man from the hellfire. And such were the scholars of Islam, really. His life was dedicated to serving faith. He prayed Fajr and stayed in the class. Then after Fajr, he answered the people's questions. Then he prayed the Dhuhr. Then he had another session with the people. Then he went out after Asr and he visited the sick and the poor and the needy. This was his day. Then he went to visit his family and his relatives and his cousins. And then at night after Isha, it was dedicated to himself. There were nights where he spent it in one wudu, from, from Isha to Fajr. Why? He stayed standing from Isha to Fajr on one salat without losing his wudu. And this was the great Imam Abu Hanifa. One man came to Abu Hanifa one day and said to him, distressed, I lost my money, I lost my money. I don't know where it is, I don't know where it is. Abu Hanifa looked at him and he said, this is not a fiqh question. You know, I don't really deal with these matters, but because of his spirituality, he said, but go home and pray to Allah. Meaning, I don't have an answer for you. I can't find your money for you. So he went. He started praying and praying and praying. Then the man remembered and he found his money. Immediately, he raced back to Abu Hanifa and said, Imam, Imam, it worked. You're the greatest. I thank you. I prayed until I found it. Abu Hanifa looked at him and he said, of course you're going to find it. That was the shaitan who made you forget. But when he started praying, he thought this is not a good deal. He didn't want you to keep on praying, so he reminded you where it was and you found it. And that's when you stopped praying. Rather than coming and thanking me, you should have spent more time praying to thank Allah. And such was the thoughts of Imams Abu Hanifa and Imams like him. Whenever Abu Hanifa would see his students, he'd look at them first before he starts his lesson. And he could see his eyes full of compassion and sometimes with tears. And he'd smile and say to them, You are the joy of my heart and the removal of my sorrow. Removal of which sorrow? The sorrow of the hereafter, because they will testify for him. And the joy of his heart, he, they are his legacy. He had over 900 dedicated students. We're talking about 900 of the most specialized in every area. Whenever Abu Hanifa was about to give a matter, he would get his students and they would study it. Study it, study it, and he would not confirm the verdict until everyone had agreed that it was right. And every time they agreed, he would prostrate to Allah, pray two rak'ah and say, Alhamdulillah, who has not urged me off the path. And that's how he used to reach his rulings. Among the sayings of Abu Hanifa are the following. No one has been in greater loss than someone who attains knowledge and the knowledge did not prevent him from haram. Secondly, a person who talks about religion and does not think that he will have to answer for what he says does not know the meaning of religion. Thirdly, if the religious people are not friends of Allah, then God has no friends in this world. Number four, knowledge of religion will never have its roots in your heart if you learnt it for the benefit of this world. And lastly, he said, to have learned disagreements with someone, like you want to disagree with someone on knowledge, with someone who has no sense of knowledge, is to annoy that person unnecessarily. We said that the new Khalifa, the new leader of the Muslims was al Mansur. They had taken over the Umawi era. And he thought that the Abbasid, the Abbasid empire is going to be better, but unfortunately they were even worse. Corruption in the courts, corruption in favorism, taking money from the people in, 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 in Zakat and spreading it among their relatives and family, giving leadership and the seat to their sons or their relatives, and so on and so forth. Imam Abu Hanifa opposed that tremendously, and all the scholars did as well, but he stood up the most. He was the most vocal. 
You know how today, within the 21st century, there's new ideologies such as atheism, Scientology. Well, in those days, the knowledge that was corruption was something called the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij. In Abu Hanifa's time, the Khawarij were more. The Khawarij, they started the time of Ali radiallahu anhu a little bit before, and they're the ones who killed Ali radiallahu anhu. They killed him because they, they basically told him he's out of the fold of Islam. The problem with these people, Khawarij, they were terrible, man. They had beards longer than yours and mine. They prayed more than you and me in the night. They memorized the Quran and read it better than any one of us. They had so many good, and you think that these are saints, these were angels sent from the sky. But their character opposed it tremendously. These people were about very violent, and they went to extreme. They were so extreme that they said, they made a person a kafir only when they did a major sin, like drinking of alcohol or zina. You'd become a kafir. Become a disbeliever. They also said that anyone who doesn't agree with our view is also put to the sword. One of them was Abu Hanifa, he didn't agree with the Khawaj. So one day they entered upon him with the sword. That's what they were doing. They were going around to people and they were questioning them. Do you believe or do you not believe? Abu Hanifa was a very smart man and he said something that started the trend which saved the lives of many people. They entered upon him one day while he was studying, they bashed the door down and they said to him, repent. He said, from what? What do I have to repent from? And they said, repent from your views that are against us. And then when he saw that he had to either agree with them or get himself out of it in some way, otherwise they're going to kill him, he recited the verse from the Qur'an. And if any one of the polytheists, idol worshippers, seeks your refuge, then give him refuge. Like, don't touch him until he hears the words of Allah. They considered Abu Hanifa a polytheist, a kafir. So he used the verse about the kafir. Like, what can he do? He didn't say, I'm a kafir. So he just went their way. If you can't beat them, you've got to go along their way. And that's a very smart, wise thing to do. By that, he saved his life. So he said, if a polytheist seeks refuge, they give him refuge. And the, and the Khawarij, they looked at each other and they said, leave him alone. He has used the words of God against us. He's a polytheist, we can't touch him. So he became a thorn in the hearts of the Khawarij. There was another Khawarij, his name was al Dahak. He once came into the masjid and he said to him, repent. He said, repent from what? And he said, I am told that you agreed to Ali, that when Ali said, having a dispute with Muawiyah, he decided to settle his dispute by having what they called an arbitrator. The Khawarij, they didn't believe in that. And they also accused Ali of getting an umpire from his family, like someone who is his friend. They said, this is wrong. And you, Abu Hanifa, you agree with what he did. So repent. If you don't repent, the sword. So Abu Hanifa looked at him and he said, then let me speak. He said, I want to debate you. He said, okay, if you want to debate me, then how are we going to know who's right or wrong? We have to put an umpire, an arbitrator. He said, okay, put him. And the Khariji, he pointed to a man who was also from the Khawarij. And then Abu Hanifa said, you just did exactly what Ali radiallahu anhu did. So why are you disputing with me? And that's how he immediately, bang, straight away, the Khariji person, he put his head down and he had nothing to say. He walked out and he never repeated what he said to Imam Abu Hanifa ever again. Abu Hanifa distanced himself from every kingdom or palace because he felt that they were going to attract him to say the wrong thing. And he was, they could easily use it. And today still people use scholars for their own benefits, right? He used to say to the people, be careful, be careful of going to the Khalifa, the leader. And fear him just like you fear fire. Don't go to him, to his courts, except for some specific purpose. And if he has given you a post of a judge, don't accept it, unless you are sure he will accept that you exercise your personal judgment. You will judge even against him. If he doesn't accept it, don't accept his job to be a judge. So that you don't get pressured and never accept a position that you are not fit with. These were the words that Abu Hanifa used to advise his students and people. An official one day said to Abu Hanifa, visit me, I want you to visit me at my house. Abu Hanifa asked him, why? What for? Now normally you should visit people, but this official you see, he knew that he used to use the scholars. So he said, why should I visit you? And he said to him, visit me so I get, get to know you more. He said, I do not visit people in power. And he got angry at him. And so the people in power began to resent Abu Hanifa. 
He had enemies, and his enemies were the people in power. They wanted to use him to their advantage. There was a governor of Iraq by the name of Yazid, Ibn Amr Hubayla. He once called Abu Hanifa to him. And he said to him, I want to give you the position of chief treasurer. Abu Hanifa immediately said, never. Yazid said to him, why? If you ask me to guard the doors of the mosque, I wouldn't listen to you, let alone guarding the money of the Muslims and standing up for you so that when you seal the death of a Muslim and you sign it, I have to carry it out. Yazid got so angry with him that he ordered his imprisonment for going against him and he ordered that he be whipped every day 100 lashes. Abu Hanifa in prison. Until finally he found that his students were protesting for him. He had no other choice but after 30 days to release him. We said that the Khalifa al-Mansur came up and he also tried to do something to Abu Hanifa. One day he called him and he said to him, I want you to be the chief judge of all of Iraq. I want you to be the chief judge. Imam Abu Hanifa said to him, never. Because then I will have to rule in rulings in favor of the people in the right way. But when it comes to you, will you accept my ruling, even if it's against you? The Khalifa got angry at that state. He didn't expect something like that. You don't talk to the leader like that. He said to him, you must take the chief judge position. Abu Hanifa said, I am not fit for that position. So then the Khalifa said, you're a liar. And then Abu Hanifa said, well, that just proves my statement. Then. If I am a liar, a judge is not fit to be if he is a liar. The Khalifa got so angry at him that from that day onwards, he resented him more and more. And because later on, as he resented him and he kept on refusing these positions, he finally imprisoned him. Merely for the fact that he would not accept the position, the post of being chief judge. Why? Because he was afraid. <coughs> this post, you're going to be questioned about. He didn't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with lots of baggage. And he knew that the government was going to use him. So he got imprisoned for it. And they dared not whip him. So the Mansur, al Mansur, he, he said the students wanted to come and learn from him. So he had to allow the students to come and learn from him from behind bars. He had thousands of students coming to learn from him while Abu Hanifa was inside the prison. And he began teaching people while he was behind bars and the rest of his students were in front of him. He stayed in this way for three months to the point where he kept talking against the corruption of the government to the point where the narration says that or well, the government got so annoyed of him that they poisoned his food and when he felt the poison of his food he began to pray in prison for a few days and he died in his prayer Rahmatullahi alayhi He was about 70 years old died in the year 767. Before he died, he had written a will. After warning people away from the corruption of the government, he said, when I die, I bequest you not to bury me in any land which was given by the Khalifa to any of his relatives, his family. And that meant that the people opened their eyes and said, what, the Khalifa is giving land, our land to his relatives and family? So it made even more of a problem. And it is read from Al-Mansur who used to say, Abu Hanifa, we are not saved from Abu Hanifa. Neither in his life were we saved, and even in his death I am not saved. His funeral prayer, on the first day of his funeral, 50,000 people came to attend it. People kept on coming from all around Iraq, and even outside of Iraq. It was so much so that the body of Abu Hanifa had to be laid there for the whole day from Fajr until sunset because six janazas were made for him and each time the first one was only 50,000 and the rest were more. He died in Baghdad and was buried in Baghdad in Iraq. The school of Hanafis spread throughout the Seljuk Turks. The Turkish Sultans took it as the Hanafi Madhab. The Ottoman Empire followed the Hanafi Madhab. All the principles and most of the principles that scholars came after him, 90% of them they used the principles of Abu Hanifa to deduce and deduct rulings. Among them was Imam Shafi'i, and this is what he said. Anyone who wants to excel in Islamic law cannot do so without referring to Abu Hanifa. 
Allah has blessed him with gift of wisdom and understanding. Imam Ahmad, when he was asked about Abu Hanifa, he said, Subhanallah, in matters of knowledge, piety, abstinence from the dunya, and preference to the hereafter, he was of the highest stages that nobody else would be able to occupy. He was lashed for the simple reason that he refused the post of a judge offered to him by Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. May Allah's mercy shower him and may he attain the pleasure of Allah. This is what Imam Ahmad al-Muhammad said about him.